Greetings and welcome to the Go Global World Daily 5-Minute Podcast. And guys, for the second time ever, I know I'm really good at breaking the rules. This is going to be way over five minutes, like our last YouTube episode. So as stated previously, this is either going to be of high value to you guys or I can waste your time for 30 minutes. It's really up to you. You know, the human, the human mind is very subjective. But... In, t- in today's episode, we're going to be talking about something that's very, very important, right? Th- th- through the air you breathe and the water that you consume. Those of those people that live in America, the concept of clean water in Ohio is very synonymous right now. But uh, yeah, that was my very sad attempt at humor, but I hope you guys appreciate it. We're, we're going to be talking about a very intriguing climate tech venture capital firm trends in the climate tech industry to include market trends, the current problems, like they're literally everywhere. Uh, For you founders out there, we're going to be going over a copious amount of due diligence in the climate tech space, just because there's a lot of total addressable market in the climate tech. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're going to be passed right away, but it's okay. We got you. And towards the end, we're going to be speaking something very close to my heart, and that's diversity in this space. Because me being myself, I am a first-generation college student. I am two minorities, Hispanic and Black, and we have a very, and we have a very accomplished, underrepresented investor here that we're talking with, and we have the honor of having their time. So speaking of talking, I have talked way too much and I consider it a dishonor to introduce somebody of very high esteem. So I'm going to let the person that is co-hosting the show today let us know about their venture capital firm and how it came about. Yeah, so thanks thanks for the introduction, Chris. I'm very excited to be here today. And um, yeah, I'll be speaking to you from the perspective of a climate tech venture capitalist and specifically one that has a background in chemistry. So I'm a chemist by training who turned into a climate tech venture capital investor, basically from a standpoint of passion, right? So during my research years as a chemist, I was working on a process to convert greenhouse gas CO2 into sustainable fuels. And being in the lab, I just started wondering, how can I make a bigger impact? Because in the lab, I was just converting a couple of grams of this greenhouse gas to fuels. And eventually with that thought, I um, I, I spun out of academia and ventured out into the venture capital world to make an impact um, in the real world. And now as head of science at Extensia Capital, I'm, uh, I'm the in-house chemist. I look into uh, different technologies in the climate tech space, and I'm also a thought leader and an investor. So Extensia is a firm. We are, we are a Berlin-based venture capital fund that's very climate first. So before, um, before investing in any type of technology, we first ask ourselves, can this technology save at least 100 million tons CO2 equivalents per year when it's deployed at full scale? Now, because of this initial question that we ask, our typical investment is more uh, more focused in the hardware space, right? So think of the difficult to abate sectors like e-fuels, hydrogen, biogas, or basically anything that's related to the chemical industry. Um, so I just want to, yeah. I just want to be before you keep raining us with this beautiful information. I want to back this up real quick because there, there are some things in here that's very unique and a lot of people are very. Pa- So when I think of the typical VC investor, pretty sure that's like anywhere, right? It's like a founder that's done really well, has exited. Maybe sometimes if he's really proud, he'll put in his LinkedIn headline, oh, 10 times exit, whatever. So you're saying that you're a scientist before this. You're a chemist. Now, how in the world did you build the street cred to become a venture capital in investor because i've only heard of two things here in america one you're a founder that's exited two you got rich parents up in high places so how in the world did you go from scientist to venture capital investor yeah it's it's a great question chris and i yeah i'd love to answer this i, I think um I was also a little bit lucky here. So I was really at the right place at the right time. So for me, the first time I got introduced to the concept of venture capital, which is typically not something you know as a chemist. Um, This was when I was living in Silicon Valley. So back in 2017, I spent some time in the Valley um, doing research there actually. And I saw the whole sort of realm of venture capital, right? Which yeah was kind of born in Silicon Valley. But back then to me, it seemed more like a software thing, right? 
venture capitalists were investing in big software businesses like Apple, Google, Facebook. And I did not yet see the connection with chemistry or like climate. But a couple of years later, after my research journey, I started seeing more of these climate tech venture capital funds. And I was wondering, well, maybe as a chemist, I can contribute here because I know how these technologies work in detail. So then I, I, I really also did not have any connections in the world, to be honest. And I started with very simple, very something very, very simple. So I literally Googled venture capital CO2. And then Axantia was one of the first funds that popped up in my browser. So it sounds super, super random. Sorry for that. But that's that's how it went. And I looked on their website and they were actually looking for a head of science. And when I read the description, it sounded like, yes, that's what I want to do. And this is also a way for me to contribute as a chemist to an investment fund. Um, so yeah, I, I basically sent in a cold application and started talking with yeah with the people that started Extantia and we yeah hit it off straight away and now I'm here actually. So long story short, being at the right place at the right time and maybe also taking a little bit of courage, right? Because it took me a bit of courage to write the cold application and I, I definitely had this like fear of failure when where I thought well maybe they will not take me at all. Like why should they take me, right? Um, yeah, so I was I was a little bit lucky actually. Well, I mean, you created your own work by one having a skill set that people couldn't deny. And two, I mean, you spent some time in Silicon Valley. I mean, you spend any amount of time there, you know, doors are like everywhere. So let's dive like directly into your fund. I'd love, I think you told us a little bit about your thesis in the carbon emission, but anything about like your guys' current investments, investments, focuses. I think we had a conversation about like how you guys also work in a fund of fund structures. And I guess, uh, some of your most recent in investments. I know that was a very long run on question, but yeah, we just mm -hmm. all want to know what this is all about. Yeah. 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 So I'll, uh, I'll try to address the questions and please um, yeah, feel free to steer me at, at any time. So we're looking for technologies always that can abate a lot of CO2 emissions. Um, that sounds, yeah, maybe not so concrete, but to make it a little bit more concrete, we currently have a 300 million euros platform of which half of it is for direct investment. So 150 million is for investing in climate tech startups. And then the other 150, 150 million is for investing in other climate tech funds. So we, yeah, in that sense, love to support our peers in the space and also see fund of fund investments as complementary to what we do. So that could be in terms of geography or in terms of focus area. So we would, for example, select a fund that invest in technologies that are relevant to climate, but technologies that the, we don't feel we have a strong background in. So for example, as a chemist, I might not know that much about food related technologies and um, I, I cannot contribute in that way to Extantia, but then Extantia can decide, okay, let's invest in a food related fund because food is important. It currently has a big impact on the climate and we would like to support our peers that are investing in food. So that's how that can come about. Um, for the direct investments, we typically invest tickets between one and five million euros in startups that are relatively early stage. So think of a seed or series A investment. We typically, we feel comfortable taking some risk, but we would at least like to see the R&D part being de-risked. So we would like to see it like a technology readiness level around four prototype. That's kind of like the bare minimum because as a, yeah, as a venture capital fund, you want to build a great business out of a great product and you don't want to invest in R&D because these are risks that we cannot really take as a financial investor, um, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think in most other sectors that don't really have that much you know, of an environmental impact, R&D is just like one of those line items that kind of get written off. So you know, like people yeah. kind of waste it and then, oh, okay, they kind of they kind of tank because they're R&D, but like, R&D is literally built into climate tech because this stuff is at scale, you know, like I argue that in climate tech economies of scales everywhere because you're trying to change how the planet is sustainable. So that's kind of built in. So while we um, before going to our next point, where do you guys see your fund in about five to 10 years? Also, great question, actually. Um Ideally, we would like our funds to become the go-to climate tech investor, at least in Europe, that has a reputation of building great businesses out of great products in the climate space. And also the fund, you know, that founders come to with, with maybe like, let's say a difficult topic, like a hardware-based topic that other venture capitalists feel uncomfortable with, they come to us and we help them scale up their, scale up their great product. Nice. And uh, now, since we have the 
subject matter expert here. This is why it, when we had our initial conversation, I specifically told you I was not, I'm really good at making things up on the spot, but I am not going to a discount. So let's, can we get a climate tech overview, right? So the, I, I, I feel like this is always changing. Like in my personal research, two years ago, we were worried about carbon emissions this is just in the U.S. Now I'm starting to read things about carbon utilization because of like policymakers. And I'm like, the earth is changing, climate tech's changing. Can you give us the overview that maybe PitchBook will not give us since we have the since we have the subject matter expert here right in front of us? Yeah, of course. Um, happy to do so. So carbon emissions is look, it's still important. We still care about carbon emissions. And in the climate tech space, you will always at least in the coming years still see companies coming by that do direct air capture right so they 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 they, they develop a sorbent and they try to literally suck co2 out of the air it is still relevant because co2 levels are still high and it will still be there but now because that technology is slowly starting to take off uh, it's it's a little bit more developed right now we're not there yet but making progress the next question that we started asking ourselves is well if we captured all that co2 what are we gonna do with it, right? It's actually a resource. Instead of using carbon from a fossil-based yeah, origin, so think of oil from the ground, we can take the carbon from the CO2 and convert that into, into products that we need for our economy. So think of fuel, for example, we can literally use CO2 as a resource. So that's why this, what you're saying, carbon utilization is now also becoming a hot topic. And yeah, we see a lot, a lot of things come by in that space as well. And um, yeah, to iterate a bit on the point that the trends in climate tech are always changing, and that that is correct. We agree with you. And um, last year in December, we sat together with the whole Extancia team, and we we literally voted on the top trends in climate tech that we thought we should address in 2023. So one of these these, these topics was, for example, green ammonia. So green ammonia or ammonia in general is known as a synthetic fertilizer. And um, it's a great product, like without it, we wouldn't be able to feed about half of the current global population. So it's playing an essential role. But green ammonia or ammonia, gray ammonia is associated with CO2 emissions. So the question or the, the question for the climate tech investors is then, okay, what kind of technologies can we use to minimize or to, to reduce or to completely eliminate these CO2 emissions? And that falls under green ammonia, for example. Um, other topics that we came to um, that, that we find really interesting is mining and raw materials. So for example, for, let's say, think of, think of the, the, the traditional car with an internal combustion engine. To, to drive that car, we actually need a lot of oil from the ground. But now if you think of an electric car, for example, we suddenly need different materials for that car. Think of a battery that contains lithium, for example. Where are we going to get this huge amount of raw materials from that we will need for the energy transition. It's another question that we're um, trying trying to address actually. And um, yeah, another topic I can mention is for example, carbon utilization. We're also always looking into that as you are mentioning correctly, CO2 is also a resource um, and we like that topic. So we're, we're, we're gonna be looking into it this year. Wow, and one, I just really want to not only thank you for the overview, but not to bog me down with like the intricate science, chemical equations and all that other stuff, because I am a man of simplicity and I did not want my brain to go dead or right here right now. But no, yeah, I appreciate that because I could ask you a ton of more questions, but then you'll break it down into more science and then I'll just confuse myself further. But that is really good stuff right there. Now, this is this is the part, founders, you might want to pay very close attention to. We're going to be going over due diligence when you mix science and you mix venture capital. Now, something very interesting that, so it it's funny, right? I study a lot of Europe funds, and I think one of the ones that are also located, I'm not sure if you've heard of At One Ventures. Uh, name sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah, so they just had a recent article about, you know, they're, they're trying to set the standard for how climate tech venture capital firms are going to be working on now on it. And we talked a little bit about this, right? So you have the science team and you have the investment team. And if the science team deems that whatever technology is not good enough for society based on whatever KPI, like you guys were talking about X amount of carbon 
uh, captured or something to that effect. I'll let you explain. Then they can actually override that decision. Like, that's crazy. Can you expound a little bit on that? Yeah. So um, in general, I guess we also work with a similar principle, right? We have people on the science team that are more focused on, yeah, doing the fundamental research that, that underlies an investment and then the investment team. So the people that focus more on the actual investment, but at least at Accenture, I think these teams, yeah, they exchange all the time. It's not really like two teams. We sit together all the time and we talk all day basically um, to yeah make sure that we have that exchange going. But I do agree with that. Like if, if somebody from the science team says, well, guys, this concept sounds, they made a great sales pitch, but the concept just from a scientific point doesn't work. Then I don't think anybody in the investment team would feel comfortable investing. And that is, yeah, especially because climate tech is so most of the sort of, yeah, innovative concepts come from academic institutions or like national research labs, right? So if, this, if the science or, yeah, if the fundamentals behind it don't work, then there's no point of investing, really. Yeah, and like I feel like that's one of the few sectors that's tangible, right? Like if you figure out it doesn't, I mean, if it's not going to work, you know, in the pre-revenue stage, you know, it's not going to work on the environment, right? So I feel like this is kind of, unless I'm looking at this wrong or something, but okay, so let's yeah. get into the nitty gritty here, right? So let's talk about some KPIs when you guys are looking at climate tech startups. It's different for every sector, but I can imagine climate tech's a little bit more in the intricate side, so yeah, just uh, tell us a few that you're looking for and how that kind of plays into the factors of um, getting to the term sheet and all and all that other good stuff that people want to get to. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. Um, so maybe first, first tip for anybody who's looking to secure an investment from a climate tech investor, or maybe actually for anybody who's looking for a VC investment, know your audience, right? If you send out applications or emails to people working at funds, Make sure that you first of all know what the fund cares about. And if you're addressing specific people, make sure that you know what these specific people care about, right? Because if you're writing an email to me, I will care about your technology and I will care about that being sound. But maybe if you send an email to somebody who's who has a finance background and, and cares more about the business model, then make sure you address that. So it's in that sense, looking for venture capital investments, it is a bit like speaking on stage. You need to know who you're talking to. Tip number one. And then to get to more specific KPIs, like nitty gritty details, I think almost any climate tech startup should start off with technology readiness level or abbreviated TRL. And I mean, it depends per fund, but for us, like TRL four means that you have at least a lab-based prototype and that the science behind it is, de is de-risked. So you have tested your concept in the lab and it works. That's what we would like to see. So come with a sort of preferably picture or video of your lab-based prototype and tell us where you're at in terms of technology readiness level. Then I guess one of the biggest problems with climate and climate tech in general is everything costs energy. And the energy that we have in our current electricity grid has a carbon intensity. So when we look at the technology, we want to know how much energy it costs us. And that energy is then typically also related to a carbon footprint. So KPI one, TRL, KPI two, energy inputs, and then KPI three is actually carbon footprint. So how much, how much, like how much CO2 or CO2 equivalents do you emit with your process? And how does this compare to the current state of the art, typically fossil-based alternative that's out there? Um, and then maybe, yeah, because we're venture capital investors, in the end, it also has to be economically viable. So how, how are you going to make a profit? How are you going to get to revenue? And especially a concept that's really important, price parity. So when are you going to reach the exact same price as a fossil-based product? And even better, maybe, how are you going to be cheaper than the fossil-based product? Because yeah, whether we like it or not, the world revolves around money. So we need to make sure that we're not betting on the green premium, but we're betting on a product that can actually, yeah, the green alternative product that can actually by itself be economically attractive. Yeah, and like that's, geez, out of most sector, I mean, that's like a lot, you know, there's a lot that's <laughs> just kind of baked into one, being good for the environment, two, you know, being cheaper than the fossil fuel alternative because of like, okay, what's going to prime the customer? You know, humans are, rel are, re are relatively selfish at dark, so 
and uh, other things like that. So uh, yeah, yeah, founders, I need you to replay this little section that we just had. And don't email this woman going LTV to CAC because she will tell you that I'm not the person for that. So I guess in this last section, this is very, very important and to any sector, but we're just going to talk about diversity in climate tech. And when I say this, we're talking about underrepresented populations, whether it be on race, women, you know, there's a big disparity uh, in the United States alone, right? I mean, I think only 12% of venture capital investors, and that might be a generous number, like that's very sad to say and whatnot, but you, you can just give us kind of overview on that and how you guys are looking to kind of remedy this issue in your area of the world, right? Because we all know that ideologies are like, are like wildfire. You got to start in one area and that way it could spread to the other ones. Nobody can solve this worldwide problem in, in a day, and that's just the reality of it, so yeah no it's a it's a topic that's yeah close to my heart as well and um yeah maybe maybe let's just run straight into the headwind because some people might be listening to this podcast and they might be thinking well why should i care about diversity right because yeah maybe not everybody cares as much as we do but maybe first of all you are missing the boat if you don't open up to diversity really winning teams are diverse teams that can see problems or solutions from various angles and it, diversity or like or lack of diversity actually comes down to talent blindness. Like people are typically blind for uh, for qualities that they don't possess themselves. People are better at finding or rating qualities that they have. Um, and yeah, it's that that kind of results in a team being often a lot of the same type of individuals. And yeah, managers, for example, might be focusing more on getting the job done. Which then, which then creates a context where hidden talents that might be super important to the business, like empathy, for example, cannot really show themselves. And the first step to overcome this is really awareness. So therefore, I think it's really important that we're talking about it right now. And as you're saying, gender diversity, but also ethnicity and yeah, any other things that fall under the diversity umbrella, it's still a problem in, in, in many areas, both in the venture capital, but also in the startup scene. Um, and for example, in 2021, um, 89% of all venture capital funding in Europe went to male-led uh, startups, and only 2% of the venture capital funding in Europe went to female-led startup. And then there's another like 10% or uh, actually 9% for for mixed teams. But that that number is crazy. It's really, really, really still a problem. Um, yeah, so for, for International Women's Day uh, this year, which was the 8th, 8th of March, by the way, a public holiday in Berlin, uh, where, where we're based. It needs uh, to be a public great. holiday in America <laughs> as well, but, you know, I'm going to just yeah. let you keep going on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can vouch for it, you know, who knows. Um, but so ahead of, of that day, because we had the day off, so ahead of the day, we analyzed our startup pipeline uh, here at Extantia specifically, and we found out that only 10.4% of the CEOs that we see are female um, so, yeah, that was a kind of an alarming number, and we weren't really happy with that. However, diving, diving into specific sub-verticals, there were, yeah, there's also some good news. So we saw um, on food-related topics, for example, a 50-50 gender balance. So that was, was really good. But we did feel, yeah, quite unhappy about the low average. And, um, yeah, to, to make that better, we set ourselves specific targets to improve diversity in, in the coming year. And one thing that we're doing, for example, um, maybe let me take one step back. So at a, cap at, a, at a venture capital fund, you have something called carry. And carry is a percentage of the profits that the fund managers get when the fund is performing well. So this carry, you, I mean, some generalist funds will give it out to the fund ma managers and there's no strings attached, right? But because we are a climate fund that cares very much about climate, we have some of these um, some of this carry is tied to our own um, key performance indicators. So it already kind of meant we need to make sure that we abate enough CO2 emissions and only then do we get the carry. But now we decided to also tie this carry to specific diversity targets, which yeah is then, let's say, a big driver for everybody to care about diversity. And I think we really need that. Like It's not just awareness, it's also setting ourselves specific targets and maybe even punishments, let's say, if we don't make these targets, right? So 
Um, that's something very concrete that, that came out of this. But apart from that, we also want to expand our existing ne network by actively reaching out to underrepresented groups in climate and in venture capital networks to make sure that we just we that we see more more diversity. We want to see more female CEOs. We want to see more uh, people with different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and yeah, we will also partner with organizations that work to support women or non-binary founders or yeah, let's say non-white or non-Caucasian founders because yeah. As you can maybe hear, it's a topic that's close to my heart and we care about it a lot at Extantia and yeah, look forward to seeing, let's say, specific improvements in the coming year. Yeah, and from, I guess, just from my limited experience in the foxhole, maybe just in life in general, right? So I always see like the most powerful startup stories or just stories in general, right? When you come from the minority background or underrepresented, it's the whole grit factor. People look at problems differently under difficulty that maybe people, I don't ever think it's a bad thing to be born into privilege because nobody can control that. It's what you do with that gift is what really I'm going to gauge your character on. But you miss that you really missed the grit and the problem solving because there's a lot of data that supports, right? Underrepresented founders are able to withstand like the down markets, the down rounds, the tough times, because they've done it every day, you know, in their childhood or through their first jobs and then leading into that. So I think that's something that people are really missing. You know, people yeah. are really missing the ability to get things done quick reach those KPIs even in the down markets and then move on to the next round of financing if that's what they're interested in. So going back to your first point, yeah, I mean, that's something that people really bring to the table. I mean, you only know what you don't know. And like, it's easy to lean into the same type of frameworks that you're comfortable with, because that's what makes you comfortable. But mm -hmm. when you lean into adversity in the unknown, I, I think that's where growth is. And that's where a lot of people tend to misconstrue that so yeah no that was a very great point yeah yeah so chris what you're actually saying maybe also for yourself right is that your background having uh two being from two underrepresented groups actually gave you a lot of grit in your in your life and that's yeah what what kind of got you where where you're at right now yeah and i think everybody has you know a uh, come up story of somewhat like i think some of the best organizations in the venture world and the star world I've looked up to have been from a minority background and that's not an accident. So in, in America, you have Harlem capital. They're on fund for, they're like one of the most famous um, funds for minorities, totally changing up. And they, and they publish a report every single year about um, what percentage of the best startups are minorities and, they even break it down further. People that didn't have post-secondary education. And those guys are just at the top because they they figured it out through the school of hard knocks. And uh, I always love seeing those reports, the people that beat out the people that got full rides to Harvard because their parents, you know, were like rich or something. Not saying that's a bad thing, but some people tend to flaunt that around here in America or anywhere. I mean, I'm pretty sure, you know, yeah. I, I've got friends at London Business School as well and other places in Europe as well. But uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, like, I don't know, like people kind of weigh a lot on that. But in the age of uh, chat GPT acing exams and stuff, I feel like real world experience through adversity is going to become a lot more valuable as the world's problems become more complex. So that's just, um, yeah, that's just my personal opinion on things. And I guess while we have a little bit of time, I guess, um what are some parting like words? So let's just say founder. So, you know, the market's crazy right now. Silicon Valley bank didn't help. Not sure if you read what's going on with credit Suisse. That's even, yeah. that's a little bit closer <laughs> to your neck of the woods. That's very surprising. I got, I got friends that work at UBS. They said, you know, life is usual friends at credit Suisse. They're like, I don't know. I got to go jump banks now, but to the struggling founder, what's your best advice you have right now? Yeah. That's it's it's a good point to end with. And yes, we definitely could not being in the venture capital world, we could not miss, of course, what what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank and, and Credit Suisse, etc. And yeah, specifically to, to the climate founder, I would say it might feel a bit scary right now, but just take a few deep breaths 
and keep believing in yourself. You know, what, what you are doing for the climate, trying to make the world a better place, it's it's going to matter. Like even if if in the next few years we'll, we'll have problems with banks or, or even a crisis, you know, what you're doing is still going to matter. Like if the world will drown from climate change, we will need you. So don't give up, you know, even in hard times. Yeah. And like, this is a, you know, this is a whole different sector right now. It's different. Like if I was talking to somebody of sports betting, well, I was like, okay, you know, maybe that might not be one thing that that'll be around for 20 years, but you know, as long as we wake up in the morning, <laughs> that's, <laughs> we kind of live in the environment. We breathe the air. I hope the sky stays yeah. blue. Sci scientifically, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no. Yeah, guys, that'll conclude the episode. I'll be sure to include everything about extension capital and I'm glad she pronounced it first because I was totally about to say I was totally about to say it wrong. But um, yeah, so apart from your website, do you guys have any other communities that you guys have or any other goodies or just? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, we are we are we actually really like openness and sharing knowledge. So we use Medium as a platform to put the articles or some of the deep dives that that we've done. We, we put them out there in the open for other people to use them as a resource. So yeah, make sure to find us on Medium. And otherwise, we're also um, on LinkedIn, post small little things there from time to time. And um, yeah, hope that that will be informative to the audience. Yep, thank you. Thank you. And with that being said, guys, this concludes the second installment of the interview series for Go Global World Daily Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you guys subscribe to us and leave us a review, whether good or bad, whether I wasted your guys' time or you didn't. Search engine optimization it doesn't care what the review is. Little tips and tricks. I'll see you guys on the next one.